Good morning again. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Proverbs 27 as we continue talking about the path. Today I want to talk to you about a word that you probably don't use a whole lot in your vocabulary. Um, it's a word, though, that comes up quite a bit in the book of Proverbs and uh, is translated a couple of different ways. But uh, I've chosen to go with the traditional translation, which is the word prudence, the path of prudence. So uh, Proverbs 27 for this week and next week. Uh, how many of you have ever struggled at something in life? Some of y'all struggled to get out of bed this morning, uh, right? We've all struggled at some point, right? We've all had big struggles and little struggles. Um, how many of you like to struggle? Nope, that's me too. I don't like to struggle. Uh, if you give me the choice between struggling or not struggling, I'm going to pick not struggling every single time if I can, right? Nobody wants to struggle. The only good thing about struggles and struggling is that we learn from our struggles. We might call it experience, but a lot of our experience comes from the times that we struggle. We tend to learn the most in life when we're struggling the most in life. How, how many of you have ever struggled through something and then you got to the end of that something and you said, you know what, if I ever do that again, I'm going to do it different. Or if I ever face a situation like that again, uh, I know that I'm going to do this, this, and this because I want to minimize my struggle, right? We learn from our struggles. I've had a lot of struggles in my life, um, just like each and every one of you. My life isn't perfect. I've had struggles in pretty much every area of my life at one time or another. I've struggled relationally. I've struggled financially. Um, I've struggled physically. I've had emotional struggles in my life. I've struggled with God. I've struggled with the Lord. I've, I've had to wrestle with God on things on occasion. Uh, I have kids. I don't want to make them sound like they're bad kids. I know sometimes I, I make jokes about them being monsters and stuff, but they're really good kids. I have really, really four incredible kids. But there have been struggles. It's part of having kids, isn't it? I have a great wife. We have a great marriage. Uh, but we've had struggles in our marriage. I don't think anybody gets to, to, to be married very long without struggling. If you want to struggle, just get married. <laughs> you think, you think, get, you think, you know, I hear people all the time, oh, we're going to get married and things are going to be great. I'm like, you have, you don't know what marriage is. <laughs> if there was a picture of struggle, it would be by the word marriage in the dictionary. It's going to be a struggle. Um, we have struggles, but looking back on my life, I really feel like most of my struggles have been minimized because I learned the value of prudence at a very, very young age. I'm going to tell you a story I've, I haven't told many people. In fact, I, I don't think I've told more than two or three people this story. My mom doesn't know this story. My wife didn't know this story uh, before today. Uh, it's not a story that makes me look bad. It's not something where I did anything wrong. It's just it's kind of a scary story. To be honest, I, I started flying airplanes when I was 16 years old, started taking flying lessons, and um, I started out like most pilots flying a Cessna 150. If you don't know anything about Cessna 150s, um, it's like the smallest little airplane, not the smallest, they're smaller, but it's kind of the smallest general aviation airplane people train in. It's a little two-seater. It's not big, doesn't go fast, doesn't have a lot of power, but it's cheap, and it's cheap to fly, doesn't burn a whole lot of gas. Um, and like many young pilots, whenever you first start training, the, the most difficult thing, the thing you tend to struggle with the most is landing. And there's a, a landing called a crosswind landing where the wind is not, not coming towards you, which is the way you prefer it as a pilot, but it's coming across the runway. Now, whoever planned and designed and engineered our airport here in our city um, either didn't look at the wind patterns of Atascosa County, or they said, you know what, let's just make an airport where there's always a crosswind. Because they, they put, the, they put the, the, the airport in a direction where there's almost always a crosswind. And so you've really got to know how to land in a crosswind if you're going to be based out of here. And I had done a couple of crosswind landings. Uh, I had probably had 10, 10 hours, 8 to 10 hours at this point in my flying career, not very many 
And I'd actually soloed on a very calm day. I'd been up by myself already and, and had gotten my solo uh, sign off and, and was feeling pretty good. But on this day, I went out to the air, airport for my training session, and it was windy. I mean, crazy windy. It was right at the operational limits of a Cessna 150 for crosswinds. I remember my instructor and I talking about it. And I said, man, I think it's kind of windy. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't go today. And he said, nah, it's a good day for training. <laughs> okay. So we talked about crosswind landings, how to do it. We reviewed all the techniques, how to crab into the wind, you know, how to straighten up and dip your wing and flare and all the stuff that goes with the crosswind landing. And then we decided we were going to go do it. And all through the pre-flight, my instructor is telling me, just remember, if things go bad, just go around. If it doesn't look good, just go around. If you don't like what you're seeing, just go around. You know, you've always got that option to go around. So we go out, we get in the airplane, and we taxi out, we do our run-ups. And right before we're getting ready to take off, he said, hey, just remember, if you don't like it, just go around. Okay, great. So, man, we take off. And, man, it was bumpy. It was just blowing us everywhere. And we turned, and we came back on the downwind, and we turned and went base and turned for final, and we were getting bumped around, and I was having a really hard time just, just flying straight and level. And I knew this was going to be a, a, a rough, rough landing. I mean, it, it was a turbulent day. And when I turned on to final, I overshot it. I waited too long to turn, and so I had to tighten my turn up, which meant I had to pull back, which meant I got slow. You don't want to get slow, um, particularly when you're down low. And, and I got slow, not too slow, but I knew I got slow, so I pushed the nose over and I shallowed my bank up to get a little bit of speed back. But because I'd overshot the runway, I had to correct. And when I did that, I overcorrected, and so I had to correct. And so I'm kind of doing this, searching for the runway. And I was slow, so I had to push the nose down to get some speed. And when I did that, and while I was trying to find the runway, I got low. Not too low, not like we're going to go into the trees low, but too low for the glide slope. And so because of that, I added some power and I pulled up and I'm still trying to get everything straightened out. And I thought, you know what, I, I think I can do this. The, the whole approach was a mess. I mean, it, it, it was a mess. It was a mess from the moment we took off. I was all over the place. And I remember we came over the fence and I was still slow and I was still low and, and we came over the fence, but I thought, I can do this. I can land this airplane, and if I can just land it, we can get out, and we, I'm going to get out of this thing, because it was just a miserable day to fly. And I remember looking out the window and seeing pavement underneath me, which I thought, hey, this is a good sign. We're over the runway. Just put it down. And then right at that moment, when I transitioned up and just got ready to, to touch it down, this huge gust of wind came from our right, I mean, it literally just kind of picked us up and just moved us. And I remember glancing out the window and seeing grass and thinking, well, we're not over the runway anymore. Probably shouldn't touch down here. So I pulled up a little bit, trying to figure out what to do. And then I looked back out the window, and I see an airplane hangar in front of us because it had pushed us over to the left. And if you know about our airport, that's where all the hangars are. And just then I hear in my headset the instructor yelling, go around, go around, go around. So I crammed the power in as fast as I could, and I started to pull up, and the stall warning horn started going off. And when an airplane stalls, y'all, I know you hear this on the news all the time, but people talk about the engine stalling. It's not the engine, it's the wings. When an airplane stalls, the wings stop flying. It makes you fall out of the sky. That's why you don't want to stall. And the stall warning horn is going off, which means you have to push the nose over, but the ground isn't far away, and there's a hangar in front of us. And I'm telling y'all, some of y'all have weed eaters with more power than a Cessna 150. I mean, this little thing is just trying its best, but it just doesn't have a lot of juice behind it. And I had pushed the power in so hard that I had flooded the engine a little bit, and about a second or two after I pushed the power in, it coughed, what we call coughing. It kind of sputtered like it was going to die. And my heart stopped, and his heart stopped. And right at that moment, he said, my airplane. I said, your airplane. (laughs) Have it. (laughs) You bet it is. And he was able to push the nose over and get us enough speed, and he was calm and cool and collected, and we got a little speed, and he pulled up, and we cleared. We flew right over the top of the hangars. 
To me, it felt like we were just four or five feet over the hangars. I'm sure it was 30 or 40 feet by the time we got to them. But, but it was a pretty scary little day. We got up to altitude, and uh, he said, well, do you want to go back and continue practicing landings, or do you want to practice some navigation today? And I said, navigation, please. <laughs> and he said, great, take me to Hondo. So I got my, my charts out, and I plotted a course, I tuned in a VOR, and we flew over to Hondo. Now, the thing about Hondo is uh, it was windy in Hondo, too, this day, but Hondo has multiple runways. They face different directions, and so we were able to just pick a runway that had the wind going right down the runway. Made a great landing in Hondo. We taxied over to the little FBO. We got out, went in. I cleaned my britches and uh, <laughs> kind of caught our breath. And then we sat down, and we started kind of talking about what had happened. And I'll never forget, my instructor didn't critique my landing. He didn't critique my technique. He, he didn't say, hey, if you would have done this, this would have been better. If you would have done that, that would have been better. He started with a question. And, and he said, do you know what the difference between a wise man and a fool is? And I said, no, um, probably not. And he said this, and I'll never forget it. He said, a wise man does at the beginning what a fool only does at the end. He said, what you did was foolish. You had every opportunity to go around. You knew from the start of that approach, when you overshot the runway, it was a bad approach. You knew when you got slow the first time, it was a bad approach. You knew when you were low, it was a bad approach. And you just kept going. He said, a wise person does at the beginning what a fool only does at the end. He said, you're in an airplane. Go around. Make a second approach. He said, we flew over here to Hondo, and we picked a better runway, and we landed. And, you know, to add insult to injury, about an hour later, we flew back to Pleasanton, and the wind was calm. It was all gone. And he said again, he said, see, you could have just stayed up there above the airport. You had four hours of fuel. You could have just waited for the wind to be better. Right? Right? The wise do at the beginning what, only a f what the fool waits till the end to do. I think a lot of us are going through life kind of like that. We're, we're, we're just trying to land it. We're trying to make it work. We're trying to save it. We want to prove we can. And we get ourselves in these messes where we've got a bunch of bad options. It's not always easy to land an airplane. Sometimes it's a real struggle and it's not always easy to, to live your life. Sometimes it's a real struggle. But if you're prudent, if you're wise, you're going to have a lot better chance of surviving. Don't wait till the very end to try to save it. But that's what we do. We wait until our finances are completely shot to sit down and do a budget. We wait until our spouse gives us the divorce papers to decide, hey, I'll go to marriage counseling. Don't do it. We wait until we have cancer or the heart doctor tells us we have congestive heart failure to modify our diet and start going to the gym. We wait until our life is totally in the gutter before we start paying attention to what the Bible says and reading it and going to church and joining Bible studies and things of that nature. Proverbs 15, 24 says, For the prudent, the path of life leads upward. I think that's what we all want. We want a path that leads upward. We want a path that leads to a good place. Prudence is the key to that. Proverbs 27, 12, our text for today says this. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. The big idea for you is simply this. Seek the prudent path or you will walk the painful path. Seek the prudent path or you will walk the painful path. I've got two things for you today, two things prudent people do, two things we should all be doing, and we're going to do two more next week from the same verse. We'll continue it. But here's the first one. It's this. The prudent are able to perceive. The prudent have the ability to realistically perceive what's in front of them. You might say, well, the, the prudent think or the prudent consider 
or the, the prudent weigh their options or the prudent reason or the prudent are able to examine and evaluate their circumstances. You can say this in a lot of ways, but the bottom line is prudent people are able to realistically ponder and think about and consider what's in front of them. And I want to be specific here because the, the, the word realistic is important. Because I see a lot of people who think they're prudent, but they're, they're not prudent because they leave out that one key part of prudence, which is being realistic. Many, many people see the danger, they think about the problem, but they do it, as the old saying goes, with rose-colored glasses. They don't really like, I'll give you some examples, they don't really like the way the guy they're dating treats them. They don't like the way he talks to them. But he's cute, and he's got money. So they put up with it. They make excuses for it. Pastor, I know she's not a Christian. I know her family are agnostic or atheist. But pastor, she's a 10, man. She is so stinking hot. And I had a vision from the Lord. I'm going to be the one to save her whole family. They call that missionary dating. It doesn't work. It's been proven not to work time and time again. They're in debt up to their eyeballs. But a couple goes out on a Saturday afternoon and they come home with a $100,000 brand new SUV. And I go past them and I say, hey, nice new vehicle. That's a cool, cool car. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, we didn't want to do it, but <clears throat> had to. That other SUV we had, it was killing us on gas mileage. This one right here, 1.5 miles a gallon better than that last one. Mm-hmm. Yep, so much better. Got 4.99% interest on it. Thing's going to pay for itself in 300 years. I mean, it was a no-brainer. 1.5 extra miles a gallon? Grandma and Grandpa both died of lung cancer. Mama's got emphysema. But you think smoking's okay. It's not going to hit you the way it did them because you only smoke half a pack a day and they all smoked a whole pack a day. Listen, there's nothing illegal about dating somebody who doesn't treat you right. There's nothing illegal about... Dating somebody who's not a Christian, not a believer. There's nothing illegal about going out and getting you another car loan or smoking cigarettes. But there's also nothing prudent about it. If you're really realistically looking at it, there's nothing prudent about it. You see, the path of prudence starts with the ability to realistically perceive whatever it is you're looking at. Verse 12 says, the prudent sees danger. They can see it. They have a level of perception in their lives that gives them the eyes to see and the ears to hear and to know when danger is about. They perceive it, they ponder it, they consider what they're going to do about it. They recognize and they realize at the beginning what only the fool sees at the end. If I'm being honest with you, the problem many people face today is not that they can't see the problems or the struggles related to the path that they're on. It's much worse than that. The problem is, is that they don't want to see the problem. Just like when I was trying to land that airplane, I, I didn't want to admit I couldn't do it. I didn't want to admit that I was on a bad path. I didn't want to be embarrassed in front of my instructor and make it look like I wasn't a good pilot, I wanted to land. And instead, I almost crashed. See, many people today are in the same boat. They're on a similar path. They know that the behavior issues they're facing with their children right now while they're young are issues, but they don't want to admit it. So they justify it, they excuse it, they ignore it. They pretend like it's not an issue. But the path they're on is a bad one. People know their marriage is in trouble, but they don't want to admit it. So they just get on social media and keep posting those perfect pictures that make it look like life is grand for them. 
When you ask them how they're doing, they say everything is great. But I'm telling you, when they look out the window, they see danger. They see a hangar ahead. They see a crash coming. But they want to pretend like it's not there. It's the same with money. Debt's crushing American families today. One study found that the average American between the ages of 30 and 50 has 27000 in non-mortgage debt. So for a married couple, that'd be $54,000 of non-mortgage debt. The same study found that on average, an American family spends 27% of their income, their family's income, paying the minimum and the interest on their non-mortgage debt. Over a quarter of their income is just to pay for interest and the minimum payments they have to on all their non-mortgage debt. But we just keep spending and spending and spending like it's no problem at all. And you know what? When it finally overwhelms us, we think, man, you know, if I could go back five years or 10 years, or man, if I could go back to when I was 20 and start again, I wouldn't have taken all that debt on. I wouldn't have signed up for that. I wouldn't have gotten a new car every three years. Now, I would, I would have done it completely different. Remember what my instructor said? A wise man does at the beginning what a fool does at the end. I can't tell you how many young people I've met that say something like this to me. Well, pastor, if I knew he was going to get me pregnant, I would have never moved in with him. Now, a prudent person could perceive that when you move in with somebody before you're married and you sleep with them on a regular basis, you might just end up having a baby. These are not mysteries of the universe. Or I hear young people say, well, she's not a Christian pastor, but but boy, she's good looking. Or he doesn't treat me well, he treats me like trash, but you know how much money his family has? You see, a prudent person isn't impressed by those things. A prudent person doesn't fall into those traps. They do at the beginning what the fool does at the end. They say, bye-bye, see you later. See, if we want to be prudent people and have a positive outcome and walk a positive path toward a destination in our future, we have to have the ability to realistically perceive what we're looking at, to realistically perceive the path we're on. Proverbs 4.26 says, carefully consider the path for your feet and all your ways will be established. But you've got to carefully consider them. Have you carefully considered the path you're currently on? If you seriously and realistically and carefully considered the path you're on right now, would you say it's the path of prudence? Is it going to take you to the destination you want to go to? There's a warning offered in Proverbs 5, says essentially the same thing, but in a different way. It says this in verse 6, She doesn't consider the path of life. She doesn't know that her ways are unstable because she hasn't considered them carefully. See, when we fail to consider and ponder and perceive realistically the path that we're on and where it's going, we're on unstable ground. The prudent consider their paths. They evaluate them realistically, and then they decide what to do about it. The prudent person is able to realistically perceive the danger on any path. Seek the prudent path, or I promise you, you will walk down a painful path. Number two, here's the second thing the prudent are able to do. The prudent pivot. They have the ability to change. They have the ability and the discipline to pivot when needed. Seeing is important, But you can't be prudent if you don't have the ability to pivot when the time comes. There are many people who can see the danger, but they just continue to walk down the path. It doesn't make you prudent if you see it and identify it. It's not enough. You have to also be able to pivot once you've seen it. You see, you're not prudent because you see it. You're prudent because you see it and then you do something about it. But the ability to change is tough. Nobody wants to change. Change is hard. That's why pivoting is a mark of a prudent person. Not everybody does it. Those who aren't prudent never change. 
The ability to say it's time to go around, it's time to change course, it's time to change path, it's time to call this one off. That's a pivot. Proverbs 27, 12, the prudent sees danger and hides himself. He did something about it. But the simple, what do they do? They go on and they suffer for it. The prudent hide themselves. Other translations say they take cover. They don't just see it, they do something about it. Because they know if they don't, they will suffer for it. It's been my personal experience, and probably yours as well, that the further down the wrong path you go, the more painful it becomes to get off that path. It's better to get off of it early. It would have been way better for me to call that approach off early than to just barely get over the top of the hangers. Wouldn't you agree? That would have been much more prudent. And that's why I'm telling you the prudent person, the prudent people of this world have the ability not just to perceive the danger, but then to pivot and do something about it. Proverbs 10, 17, the one who follows instruction is on the path to life, but the one who rejects correction, the one who won't change, goes astray. In other words, if you don't change something, surprise, surprise, nothing changes. Proverbs 15 says this, discipline is harsh for the one who leaves the path. The one who hates correction will die. You see, if you leave the path of prudence, the path of holiness, the path of righteousness, the path that God has marked out for you, if you leave that path, pain is ahead. If you can't accept and apply correction, if you can't pivot in your life, you're going to crash and burn. It's only a matter of time. I hate to imagine what would have happened on that day at that airport had I waited two more seconds to cram in the power. I don't think I'd be here today. I really don't. It was that close. And that wasn't out of an abundance of prudence in my life. That was my instructor screaming because he didn't want to die that day. If I wouldn't have changed directions, if we wouldn't have changed paths, if I wouldn't have pivoted and said, it's time to go around, I wouldn't even be here. But let's be honest, changing is hard, isn't it? That's why nobody wants to do it. That's why nobody wants to change. Change takes time. Change makes you uncomfortable. Change is always difficult. You can always come up with a long list of reasons not to change, can't you? Anytime i got to change something in my life, I can come up with a whole long list of reasons why I shouldn't. It's easy to make a list like that. I'm going to give you three reasons why most people never change. It won't change. Three reasons why whatever it is in your life right now, you know you need to change. You haven't already changed. The first one is this. Because changing means you have to start somewhere. (laughs) It means you have to do something. It means you have to start somewhere. That's the next blank in your outline. And this is the main reason why most people don't change is because they don't start. You see, you have to start if you're going to change. You have to start if you're going to pivot. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is there there has to be a day when you walk into the gym for the first time. There has to be a day where you walk into the small group study for the first time. I know it's hard. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it makes you feel out of place. I know, I know you're scared and, and, and you have to control your anxiety. I, I get it. But there comes a time when if you're going to change, you've just got to start. You've got to do it, right? I've had so many men over the years tell me, you know, I really I want to pray for my family. I, I want to pray at the table. I, I want to lead my family in prayer. I just I don't know how to do it. And I don't want to sound silly and I don't want to sound dumb and I don't want to sound like I don't know what I'm doing. Well, can I just tell you, Dad, Grandpa, there's just going to have to come a time when you just do the first one. You just got to start. You just got to do it. If you never start, nothing's ever going to change. There has to be that first month where you sit down and make a budget. There has to be a month where you say, you know what, we're going to live within our means. And we're going to start right here, and it's going to be painful, and it's going to hurt, and it's going to mean I don't get to do all the cool things I wanted to do. But if I'm going to change my direction, I've got to start. 
There has to be that day where you put the bottle down. There has to be that day where you put the cigarettes up and you don't go back to them. If you don't start, it's never going to change. There has to be that time where you sit down and you say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to write a 10% tithe check. I've never done that before in my life, but I'm going to trust you and I'm going to tithe 10% from here on out. There has to be the first one. There was a first one for me. There, there, there comes, I mean, it's old hat now. I don't even think about it. It's even all automated in my life. But it wasn't like that always. There was a first one. You have to start. You have to make a solid commitment to be in church every Sunday, not just when it's convenient for you and there's nothing else on the calendar, but hey, we're not planning things on Sunday. I mean, you're going to go on vacation. I mean, obvious things like this, but, but we're not going to fill our Sundays and our weekends up with stuff because we're going to be committed to what God has for us on Sunday. People say all to me all the time, well, pastor, is it okay if I go hunting on Sunday? Is it okay if I go fishing on Sunday, pastor? Pastor, is it okay if I stay home because the Cowboys are playing at noon this Sunday? (laughs) Pastor, do you think it'd be be okay I had a long week at work if I just didn't come this week? Hey, you're asking the wrong person. You need to ask God. This is his day. It's not my day. This is the Lord's day. Like there has to be a time in your life when you just say, you know what? I'm going to give that day to the Lord. Not because it's easy, but because it's prudent. See, the bottom line is people won't change simply because they won't start. Albert Einstein said the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. Jack Welch said, if you, he said, if it's better to change before you have to. That's a good one. Roy T. Bennett said, if you want to fly, you have to give up what weighs you down. George Bernard Shaw said, those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Yeah, but what does the Bible say about change? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) I don't have enough time to go through a bunch of scripture with you, but let me hit some highlights. You'll recognize these people and their stories. The Bible's full of change. Abraham had to change his whole country, his citizenship, his residency. Jacob had to change his name. Joseph had to change all of Egypt to save that country and his family and many millions of others from famine. Moses had to change his profession late in life. He was tending those goats when God said, go back to Egypt and set my people free. Nehemiah had to change the skyline of a city and a landscape of a culture that was corrupted. Jonah had to change his direction so God could change Nineveh. Esther had to change what was going on inside of her life because God needed to use her to change the course of a nation. The prophet Jeremiah and Isaiah, many of the other prophets in the Bible, all were out there trying to change people's attitudes and minds about God. You remember Joseph, the father of Jesus? What was he going to do to Mary? He was going to divorce her. When he found out she was pregnant, he had to change his mind and his heart on that. He had to change, think about this man, that man right there had to change his entire life to accommodate God's plan for the world. Wasn't his fault, wasn't his plan, probably didn't fit into his 10, 15 year plan he had for his life. He had to change everything to accommodate God's plan. Peter was a fisherman. Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. There was some change involved in that. Matthew was a greedy tax collector. He was transformed into a gracious and generous disciple of Jesus. Every single one of the disciples, every single one of them had to change so God could use them to change the world. Paul was persecuting the church long before he was planting them. There was a lot of change that took place in his life. And what about Jesus? Well, Jesus came into the world to change the whole thing, to transform and restore all of us so we could be redeemed and made holy. The Bible's full of change. If the Bible's about anything, it's about people who changed, were changed, and at some point had to take the very first step to change. See, change isn't easy, but I'll tell you this, it's impossible if you never get started. And most people don't change simply because they don't start. 
But the prudent, well, they're willing to change. Seek the prudent path or you will walk a painful path. Number two, second reason why most people don't change is to change you have to sacrifice something. Changing almost always means you have to give something up. No more soda and fried chicken for you, fat boy. (laughs) If you want to change, you're going to have to give it up. You want to change your financial position? You're going to have to cut those credit cards up. You're going to have to live within your means. No more new cars for you for a long, long time. No more lavish vacations. You're going down to the Atascosa River. That's what you're going to do for vacation next year. Right? You're camping in the backyard. You can't afford to do anything else if you're going to change. Premarital sex, it's got to stop. You're going to have to sacrifice it, put it away. It's not God's plan for you right now. You shouldn't be doing it. Maybe it's giving up watching the news five or six or seven hours a day and reading your Bible for 30 minutes instead. Maybe you're going to have to sacrifice some time at work and maybe even making money at work or getting a promotion at work so you can actually spend time with your family who needs you who you aren't going to have if you stay on the path you're on right now at work. See, making a change or pivoting always requires that you sacrifice something. Every single one of those people I mentioned before from the Bible, every single one of them had to make huge sacrifices. Some of them, including Jesus, gave their lives as a part of change that God called them to lead. See, this is why change is hard, and it's why only the prudent pursue it. We don't want to change. You want to know why? If we're just being honest, it's because we're selfish people. And if it requires sacrifice, then we're not interested. But it's going to require it if you're going to really change. And then here's the third reason why most people don't change. When you change something, anything, when you pivot, you're going to suffer. In some way, you're going to suffer. Sacrifice almost always leads to suffering. Sometimes the suffering is just the embarrassment of admitting you were wrong. Sometimes the suffering is just the embarrassment of having to admit to your friends and family that you're changing because you realize the path you were on was a bad path. Even though you've spent the previous two, three, four, five, ten years defending that path and talking about what a good one it was. Right? When we make prudent pivots in our life, people notice. And we're going to have to explain why we've changed. And part of that's going to be saying, I was wrong. The pivot initially almost always brings about some sort of pain. The prudent are willing to endure it because they know in the end that changing their direction now and getting on a new path now is going to give them a great future later. And they're willing to endure the pain because they understand that that if they can just get through the pain, the future later is going to be so much better. That it might be painful today, but the promise of a better future, that helps them endure whatever the suffering and sacrifice is. They don't change because it's easy. Nobody gets up and says, I'm going to lose 40 pounds because it's easy. Nobody gets up and says, I'm going to get out of debt because it's easy. Nobody gets up and says, I'm going to have the best marriage ever because it's easy. They do it because they know they must to walk the path God has for them. And that change always produces some kind of suffering at the onset. And that's why only the prudent pursue it. Proverbs twenty-seven twelve: the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple, they go on and suffer for it. You see, what most people forget or don't want to admit is this. One way or another, everyone suffers. Can I say it again? One way or another, everyone suffers. The prudent suffer while they change. The simple suffer because they don't change. But one way or another, you're going to suffer. Now, you may not suffer today if you choose not to change, but the path you're on is going to lead you to pain and suffering. 
It's going to lead you to a place you don't want to go. And it's why I keep telling you, you have to seek the prudent path or you will walk an even more painful path. The person to walk the most pure and prudent path ever was Jesus. Started in a manger, it progressed into a life of great sacrifice. He didn't even have a pillow to lay his head on. He didn't have a home to call his own. The sacrifices that Jesus endured in his three years of ministry are almost unthinkable to us. But they don't even compare to the unimaginable suffering that came at the end of his life as he died on the cross for your sins and mine. He did that so I could live, so you could live, so I could be forgiven, so you could be forgiven. He did it all for you. He didn't do it because it was easy. It wasn't like, oh, that cross thing, that looks real simple. That was a fun way to spend the afternoon. I think I'll go and try that out. No. Agony, suffering, and pain. But he did it because he knew you and I would never be able to create a path that would get us to God. And so he said, I'm going to forge this path for you. I'm going to go there and die a death for you. I'm going to shed my blood for you. So your name can be written in the Lamb's book of life. So eternity can be yours. So you can be with our Father in heaven forever. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. He's the one who made the path. Romans says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we'll be saved this very day, this very hour. That's only possible because Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. It's not possible because of your works or your money or your good looks or anything else. It's possible because of Jesus. And the prudent can see that their sins, without being washed away, without being forgiven, are going to lead them to a place of pain. So are you going to make Jesus the Lord of your life? That's not going to be easy. It's going to require sacrifice. There might even initially be some suffering. Are you going to do that because the future is so much better? Or are you going to keep walking your own path? And when you get to the end of that, end up in a place without God and without Jesus for all eternity. The prudent know what to do. I pray you're one of them. Let's pray. My prayer is you would give your life to the Lord today. We don't beg you. We don't ask you. We don't coerce you. If you're a sinner in need of a Savior, His name is Jesus. The only one who could ever save you from your sins. Only person to ever die for you, Jesus. And He died so you could live you've never given your life to him, I pray that you would confess and repent this very hour, that you would call on him as your Lord and Savior this very day and be saved. If that's you, I want you to pray this with me. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, by faith, I ask for forgiveness. By faith, I repent of my sins and give my life to you. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your mercy and for your peace, for your love and generosity. Father, as we close today, I know there are many struggles in the room. I have my own share of them. I know there are a lot of people thinking about things they need to change, just trying to decide if they're going to do it or not. I'm doing the same with stuff in my life. It's easy to make excuses. It's a lot harder to start. It's easy to see it. It's a lot harder to pivot and do something about it. I get it. So, Lord, my prayer for these people today is just simply this. I pray our worship doesn't end here. I pray that you would continue to work on us this week, Father, that you would continue to remind us of what we've learned. and Father, that you would just reveal in your own way, in your own time, to each and every one of these people what they need to do.
to be on the path you've marked out for them. And Lord, I pray that whatever that path is, even if it requires some sacrifice and maybe even suffering, Lord, they would be willing to walk it and take it because you've told them to get on it. And because they know at the end of that is a reward instead of pain. Help us all in that, Lord, myself included. We thank you for those who just called on you for the first time. And we pray, Father, that they would walk with you faithfully for the rest of their days. In Jesus' name, amen.